What is going on, y'all? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspective with me, Cam Hale. And of course, as always, not sitting across from me anymore, folks, sitting directly beside me in Skeleton or Skeleton Studio B is Kyle Thick Neck Filson. How's it going, everybody? I'm here. Yes, we are in the new studio. Uh, it's, it feels different. It feels odd. You get used to working uh, in an environment or, or something that you're used to and having to change. Uh, it, it, it is. It feels odd being in Studio B, I guess is what we're going to call it. Um, for those of you asking why we were changing, uh, the, the the place where Skeleton Studios was at, um, we just... The lease, was, the lease was coming to an end. The person that owned the building, I guess, realized how much money the show makes. I don't know, but they went up on their on their lease, and we decided it wasn't a good fit anymore. So we just moved to a bigger, better place. We just started we're gonna start getting into some live streaming and things like that. So it's, it's much gonna, cheaper. This it's place. gonna work out. I think so. I like it. I mean, it's only me and you and Mary. Yeah, uh, Expanded Perspectives only has one employee, and uh, we built her office, and she's in there now. So she, everything's good. Yep, <clears throat> it's going to work out. But uh, yeah, so if, I don't know if it's going to sound any different because this room that we're recording in now, st or st Studio B or whatever you want to call it, yeah. is much larger Studio Bitchel. than Studio A. Studio A was pretty small. But, you know, when we started it, we were on a shoestring budget. We didn't. Have, we so, were crammed in there. We were crammed in there. And <clears throat> yeah. we, uh, we always joked about the wires. And that's another thing with technology. Um, this, you know, this Rode Podcaster Pro. Has eliminated like eight devices. Yeah. And with those devices, usually they chain together. So wires go from one to the compressor, from the compressor into the limiter, and from that into the soundboard. And so yeah. there literally was thousands of miles of cord and, and cables in there. And so now we're able to streamline. We've only got about six cables in here right now. So. I'm not completely finished. Like I want to build yeah. a desk. And then when that's done, we'll start live streaming. So. And I know we might be getting messages uh, privately where people want to send photos. They want to see the studio and see what we're working on. But it's under construction right now. So uh, we'll, there'll be photos coming in the There'll future. be video. There'll be live streaming yeah. video coming very, very soon on top of all the other videos we're going to release. I'm kind of excited about that and then also not because just like with anything you do, um, there's going to be people that are – excited or happy about what you're doing and there's also going to be trolls out there making fun of my bald head oh yeah uh you yeah. know that i don't look like an abercrombie and fitch model uh but you know that comes yeah with you it. do you <laughs> just look like the before <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah. got to tell them why your new your your nickname has changed uh the thick neck yeah um I, yeah i went to a doctor recently folks because <laughs> i've uh i got a problem with snoring and it's increased uh, a lot tenfold of, over the last 10 years. It really has like 10 years ago. I didn't snore at all. And then it was like every once in a while I would snore and it's progressively gotten worse and worse. And to the point where <laughs> my wife, you know, doesn't even allow me hardly to sleep in the same room with her because it keeps her awake. And I feel bad. And when we go on these baseball tournaments and we have to, we have to rent a hotel for the family. Like everybody's annoyed at me. People throw pillows at me all night. People <laughs> kick me, you know, it's four against one. So enough's <laughs> enough. So anyways, I went to this sleep specialist and, they were doing a lot of testing, and uh, my nose has been broken numerous times because I grew up playing hockey, and that's part of the problem. Like, my left side, I can't even breathe out of it as far as other problems. And one of those problems is the doctor told me I have a thick neck. <laughs> Who knew? I knew. Now, I knew Cam had a thick neck because back when we used to do <laughs> jujitsu, do never don't have an attempt to choke Cam. You have to use joint manipulation if you want to beat him. Neck, don't worry about it because all he does is sucks down like a turtle. You're not getting your arms around it. Even if you do, it doesn't do anything besides gash your arms out. So. <laughs> but I never thought of myself as having a thick neck, but it turns out it's true. You do, yeah. So uh, that's the that's the the joke going around the uh, the two families, the Hale family and the Phil's family. Is everybody hits me with the the thick neck joke? Uh huh. Old thick neck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so fun. Well, that was one of the things when they were asking me when they were when I was first there. They asked me like, "What's your neck size?" I don't have any idea. I don't wear a shirt and tie to work. Yeah. Like I work for myself all the time. So I'm like, no, doc, this is pretty much the way I dress. What you're looking at, bro. <laughs> Camo shorts, t-shirt. I have no <laughs> idea. I'm like, I've, I've had to wear shirt and tie before in my life, uh, weddings, funerals, things like that. But, uh, so they were like, well, most men know their neck size. Well, this one don't. So yeah, I do now. It's like 17. Yeah. You're like, sorry, this isn't going to work. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, uh, on the bright side, uh, they I have to do a sleep study, so I'll be doing that. I did a home sleep study, and uh, they got Failed. some data from that. Well, I, I'm sure. It's going to take like two weeks before I get the results for that. Uh, after that, uh, I don't know. But he told me 
that uh, there is a solution. So it may even be surgery. Surgery is probably likely. Uh, I would say it's more than likely. Yeah. You know, so that's, yeah. that, that's what's been going on in my world. Folks, go to see, get, go to a doctor, get a checkup. If you have any kind of problems with snoring and stuff, because uh, apparently they can fix it. This is going to come, this is going to unravel everything around you now. <laughs> You're going to be on all kinds of medications and surgeries. Oh, and- that's the thing. Like, uh, okay. So they, they, they already gave me some prescription medicine for allergies and stuff. My wife's like, have you been taking it? And I'm like, no. Nah. I took it. I took one. They're like, why not? I'm like, I don't need a bunch of drugs. I've been living this long with my allergies. You better get on it because she's not going <laughs> to let up now. Like, now no. that they give it to you, she's going to be. I told her, I go, don't you think? Don't you see the racket they do? You go there, they'll find something that you need to get a prescription for. You sound like for. your dad. Don't you see the racket? Well, you, let that sink in. You <laughs> used to sound like your dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the guy that's had a stroke. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, listen maybe to my you wife. Should. Yeah. But uh, enough about me. <laughs> enough about me. Uh, let's get into some news, Brad. Oh, dude, I've got some good stuff here that I want to share with everybody. Not to mention, first of all, look, folks, if you love all the wild stuff, of course you do, that we've been covering, our buddy Lon, his, you know, because you send us some great stories and then we share them with Lon. Lon will post them up on his page. They get to go around, right? Everybody loves a great story. So Lon knows that, that, that I like thunderbirds and i like the idea of stuff like so he started posting more of it and apparently he's received a lot more information about these giant bird sightings not just you know where, where we would talk about i don't know why you see a lot of them in like pennsylvania and ohio you know we, i don't know uh, there's a bunch of them around there and whatnot <clears throat> but he's got some that he's released now that were viewed from california georgia new york and north carolina now also lon's got a new book out too so he i love how he does that where he releases books that has all of these different sightings and these different yeah, encounters in it. So this one right here was sent by JB. JB says that some years back in 1993 in Chino, California, about 20 or so of us noticed, so there was 20 of them, noticed what appeared to be a five-foot-tall black bird just chilling on a gate. Yeah, that's right. Say that again. On a gate, just hanging out, a five-foot-tall black bird. Whoa. Says, as it jumped off the gate and onto the ground, it was about, this is what I like, 1.5 to 2 feet taller than the 3-foot gate. So no. a foot and a half to 2 foot. So that's, but look, that's a good way of measuring. I mean, it's not one of those things like a scale invariance type thing. You would think it looked big on the gate. It jumps off the gate. It's small, smaller than the gate. You realize, okay, it tricked me, right? Like, oh, yeah. It jumped off the gate, and it's 2 foot taller than the 3-foot gate. gate. Yeah. Than the gate. He says it was scary looking. And the wingspan was long. He said, I would say maybe 12 to 18 feet. Jesus. So if you've got something there, look, like we always say, like you, you make some crazy statements, but you need something for scale to back these things up. And when he's on a gate that you can see and you can walk up when it's gone and stand by the gate and be like, right there's where it landed. This is how high it was. That's a pretty good scale for reference there. Now, A.S., writes in that I saw a Thunderbird perched on a limb as I was walking down Lookout Mountain in Georgia back in 1990. Lookout! Now, here's what's crazy. That's about the time I was there. When I was a kid, I went to Lookout Mountain right around that same time. Oh, you've been there? Yeah, I've been there. I had some cousins that lived. I went and stayed with them all one summer for like, it was over a month up in Georgia. And we went to Lookout Mountain and the whole thing. So I've been there. And what's crazy is it was 8990 right around that time when I went says, I looked up, and at the same time, it was looking down at me. And he says, the Thunderbird literally bounced on the limb, flapped its wings, and flew off. It was solid black from head to foot, and it never made a sound. Now, with that story there, folks, it said it just looked down as he looked up. Right. There was no scale, no size, just said it was big. Well, that goes back into, was it? How big is big? How big What's is your exactly? definition of big? Right. What did you measure it against? We're not talking about a three-foot gate here. We're talking about what looked like. I've seen buzzards look. You know, we always, what's always the joke we always have with each other? Hogs. Always guys will tell you how big these hogs are. I saw a 400-pounder. I saw a 600-pounder. And then the guy will shoot one, and you'll see it, and it'll be 180 pounds, 200 pounds. Because Most of them aren't even that big. When you get in the moment, people, you know, you get, we've talked about this. You get a little carried away. So this thing, yeah, look out. Okay, I got it. But now Biff. Biff, now Biff, (laughs) don't try to cheat me. That's only one (laughs) coat of wax. All right, so Biff writes in, when I was a kid back in 1967, 
I attended an all-boys camp in the Adirondacks called Camp High Rock. And one morning, the entire camp, while assembled for roll call, witnessed one of these Thunderbirds fly over. Two of the counselors ran to the office to grab cameras, but it was gone before anyone could fully understand what they had seen. It says, now, I'm 63 years old now. So that was 50 years ago. But that's what I saw. So you're still talking about a group of people that were there and counselors. So undoubtedly, this is goes back into what I was talking about. It's hard to look. I can brush off the idea of one guy maybe making a uh, a mistake and claiming they saw something that it's maybe it wasn't really that big, right? And these are and these are birds. These aren't like these are sightings of a pterosaur. Yeah, or these are birds, giant birds. Just a giant. Feathered bird. So if we're talking, he says he's 63, Biff was, and that was 50 years ago. So we're talking, he was a kid in 67. So let's say he's 12, 13, 14 years old, right? Yes. So if you're there, you got to assume, safely assume, let's just say there's at least a dozen other kids your age around you. What are the counselors? 19 to 20? You know, that's college age kids that's probably doing the counseling. Whatever it was they saw, it was big enough for the counselors to want to run and go get a camera. So it's not like a a juvenile saw this. It's not like a teen saw this and panicked or freaked out, you know. And it was a group of people and two older count. They all believed what they saw. So it's not anything that's almost like okay, I get it. There's a group of people saw it, you know. Now this was one from Fox X. I love these names. <laughs> Fox X writes in that says, "I saw the fleeting end of a bird." That's wingspan touched two pine trees on opposite sides of a farm path that a combine regularly drove through. Yeah, a combine. Said it had to be, you ready for this? I'm ready. At least 30 feet. I want to say 13 feet, but after measuring it, it was closer to 30 to 45 foot. And the wingtips almost touched both sides of the trees as it flew down the trail. Says, now get a load of this. Silly. But it happened in Newton Grove, North Carolina, in 2012. Wow. My, yeah. My first thing is, could it be uh, an object much closer so it yes. looks like it's yes. that wide? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course it could, yeah. Like if I stand like this in an alley and get close to you, it'll look like my hands are touching both buildings. But if it's flying, foot, I don't know. I mean. If it's flying, either way, let's say it's flying away from you. Yeah. It's going to look like it's going to touch it. But if it's as it's going down the trail and it still looks like it's going to touch it all the way down the trail. It's the same as if it's coming at you. Yeah. As it's, as that distance goes, it big is big, right? You know what I mean? Like as you see it go now, L writes in that giant birds do exist having seen and heard one myself. I was deer hunting and I heard a slow swishing sound for about three minutes. And then I saw what looked like a giant hawk fly over. It says this was at about 16-foot wingspan, I would say, on the conservative side. Now, I've flown RC airplanes, and I've seen different size aircraft, and it's possible to get a fair idea of its size and height from a distance. I've also seen ordinary hawks with as much as a 6-foot wingspan, but the bird I described was absolutely huge (laughs) and likely a freak of nature. Condors have a span of about 10 feet. However, the bird I saw was definitely significantly larger than that. <clears throat> so I like the fact that L adds was involved in RC aircraft. So given that, I will say this, you and I, we were all playing disc golf one time and uh, they were having RC planes and stuff out there and watching them fly over. This is the part that was, I almost hate to admit this after criticizing some of these guys talking Criticize, about it. Criticize, <laughs> criticize, criticize. I saw these planes fly over, right, as they're flying around these fields. Yeah. And they land, and when they land, I go, man, they didn't look that big in the air. Like, once they landed, they looked way bigger. Like, when they, you know what I mean? Like, I they get mean, in the yeah. air, you're like, oh, there's a toy. What's that thing long, like two foot? And they land, they're like six foot. You're yeah. like, holy crap, I had no idea. Well, uh, PP here, Mr. PP, says that I saw a Thunderbird a few months ago in 2017, early in the morning while I was driving on the highway to catch the bus for work. It was still a little dusky, and it caught my eye because it was huge and flying relatively low. 
It had a long beak with the pointy head and the long tail with the arrow tip, which sounds like a pterosaur sighting, what he's describing. Yes. What I found really fascinating was how the wings almost flapped in slow motion. They were flapping at quarter the speed of Canadian geese. And if I wasn't on the highway, I would have pulled over to get out of the car to take a better look. There wasn't much time for anything else. It was flying perpendicular to the way I was traveling. It was truly amazing to witness. I just wished I had had someone with me so they could have seen it too. And then last is BC. BC says, I saw a Thunderbird for sure. It scared the crap out of me. It was in Muscon. I'm going to get all kinds of corrections. <laughs> Muscogon, Muskegon, Michigan in about 1975 in the spring. So they definitely exist. If someone's still doing research on this, contact me and I'll give you all the details. So BC, if you're listening and you hear this, send us all the details, expanded perspectives, yahoo.com. We are really, really interested in hearing more about this. But so there are several little sightings where guys have like, hey, look, but it always works out like this. When people start talking about seeing it, it, it's worse than Bigfoot. Thunderbird sightings seem to be more prominent than Bigfoot sightings as everybody's like, man, that's a big bird. Yeah. And then you don't think anything of it. But I think it's because it's a bird. It's not unnatural for you to see it. Whereas a giant walking hairy hominid, instantly everybody's like, holy crap, it's Bigfoot. Whereas with this, it's just like it's man, a bird. that is an alert, unusually large bird. What is it doing here? Well, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. So uh, I, I did a wedding this weekend. Oh, yeah. How'd that go? It went great. It was a great wedding. We had a great time. It was awesome. It was about an hour south of here in a town called Hillsboro. And so we were cutting through the country, my wife and I. We're driving through the country. And as we're going, there was a little pasture off to the right. And it looked like it had like a little little, little cake feeder with like where, like where they would keep calves, like when they would separate them from their moms, right? Yes. And as I go by there, there's no calves. There's no goats. There's no anything. But what looks like a dog just milling around out there. There's a little tank where you, you know, you can water and whatnot, but this dog is abnormally large. Like it's one of those where you look at it. It's almost like a large calf. Like, I mean, it was taller. You saw a dog man on all no. Well, this is what it was. It was real light colored. You know, I'm like, I can't tell you the exact color, but I would say tan. And it looked like it had a white ring around its neck. Uh, in, in the hair, okay? Uh -huh. But it was big. It was real big. And I just kind of glanced at it, and, I, and my wife was looking out the window, and I go, that's a pretty good-sized dog. And she kept looking, and we didn't think anything of it as we passed. And then when we passed it, she turned to me, and she was like, I'm not sure that was a dog, is what she said. I go, well, what the hell else could it be out there? It wasn't a calf. I'm like, what was it? She was like, honestly, I don't know what that was. And then that was it. We never thought of it again for the rest of the day. We didn't talk about it till on the trip back home. I was like, where was that big dog at? You just had a cryptid encounter. Well, I, but, <laughs> I'm, but it is. It's one of those things I'm like, what could that have been? Right? right. Like, what is that? Like, and I'm I'm still thinking like it had to have been a dog. It was just, but my wife was like, I don't know. It was awful big, but it wasn't built like a calf. Like lots of times calves are all legs. You know, they got thick yes, bodies yes. as they get older. But this was legitly built like a canine. I don't know. It was just really strange. And like I said, I, I, but yet again. When you see a dog, it's just like seeing a bird. You don't think a lot of it. You're like, oh, right. look. Like even when guys report seeing black panthers or, you know, any of this, or even when they say they see, which is the Texas chupacabra, the hairless coyotes, or the blue dogs, yes. you see them, you're like, oh, check that out. And then nobody does anything. You're like, eh, it is what it is. And you go on. That feels kind of like what some of these big bird sightings are. Of course, aside from the one where the fellow describes where he had the tail, had the arrow tip on it and all that, because that is – the pointed head, the arrow tip, that's a pterosaur. Yeah, that's a dinosaur. Yeah, that's a dinosaur. But yet again, it goes back into slow motion flapping wings or where they don't flap them at all. What's funny is the birds seem to flap at normal speeds. The pterosaurs don't. seem to not flap or flap at slow motion. Yeah, it's really, yeah. really strange. We constantly ask people to send us their stories, and a guy named Tyler did recently. Check this out, Cam. This is a possible Sasquatch encounter in los padres national forest in california he says just for some background around august of last year i was working for a gun and hunting rights organization here in california i was working a hunting camp one weekend with my employer at a boy scout camp in ventura county california 
We were in the Los Padres National Forest, about 75 miles outside of Los Angeles, near the community of Fraser Park. Now, one day, I was talking with the ranger for the camp, who lives up there full time, and oversees the camp in between visits from various groups. I just casually asked if he had ever had any experience with anything weird while living in the area. And he said, yeah. He stated that one night around 11 p.m., he was out on the cabin porch talking to the previous ranger who worked the camp when he noticed a figure that looked like a person walking in the trees in the distance. The former ranger asked what he was staring at, and he said, I think I saw someone walking in the woods back there. And the old ranger said, huh, oh, that must be the Sasquatch that frequents here. We've all seen it. We meant the other former rangers and full-time staff. Now, additionally, the ranger has also stated that deer, rabbits, and other animals are often startled by something in the nearby forest. But he is only able to hear whatever it is run off. He also adds that the valley is uh, former Kumash land. And there are archaeological sites throughout the area and that many hikers who make the trek to this area have also often reported hearing strange sounds. And they often report that they feel like they're being watched, Cam, while out hiking. He says, when I was up there, I didn't see anything for myself. But if there is any creature, I'm sure they were scared away from the camp after days of shotguns going off. Thanks for what you do, Tyler. So that's a pretty interesting story. We've heard similar stories to this where somebody asks a forest ranger Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of half asking, kind of joking around. And the ranger's like, no, yeah, yeah, no, we've, we've seen one. There's one around here. Uh, Actually, everybody that's ever worked here has seen him. So that's, that's pretty strange, but that's not strange enough. uh, Our buddy Lon Strickler has had other sightings in and around the Los Padres National Forest. And this one, he says, comes from about a year and a half ago. He says that uh, in in this report, the person says, recently I saw one of the most elusive creatures which may inhabit the Los Padres National Forest. I believe I saw Bigfoot. The sighting was on the evening of December 28th last year while watching a herd of deer grazing in the oak woodland immediately north of Lake Casitas. It says the herd of eight deer abruptly stopped their grazing and looked up in alarm. The sun had just set. As the darkness came in, a large, upright, walking, furry figure that appeared instantly and was moving along the edge of the woodland towards this deer herd. The deer moved to the other end of the woodlands. The creature, which has been seen in the Casitas watershed many times over the years, did not appear to be in a hurry, but did disappear back into the sh- uh, shrubs. He says the creature was eight to nine feet tall with light brown fur, and walked upright. Now, this person's name is RB, but what's interesting is this is the exact same location, the same area. So I wonder if there is, you know, if it exists or not, that there is a family of Sasquatch living in the Los Padres National Forest. Who knows? But uh, it's time for a break. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about some strange eyewitness accounts from unusual sightings. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to expanded perspectives and we're back with expanded perspectives um from time to time well not from time to time oftentimes we get stories from you listeners and not just from listeners directly emailing us but we work closely with a man named lon strickler who has a website called phantoms and monsters and if you're not aware of that then you're really missing out lon strickler also has a podcast called arcane radio And he's a blogger, probably the best there is when it comes to paranormal. And whenever we get interesting emails sent to us, we always forward them over to Lon. And Lon does the same thing. When he gets interesting stories, he sends them to us. So it's worked out really good. But in addition to blogging, you know, and and relaying these amazing stories and encounters people are having, uh, Lon compiles them and puts them into books. You can get these in paperback. You can get them for your Kindle uh, or something like that, but just go to Amazon. I'll put links to them in, in the show notes, but he's got several books out so far. One of them is called Unexplained Encounters. One's called Mysterious Encounters. One's called Bizarre Encounters, and he's even got one called Cryptid Encounters, and these are collections of stories sent to him by fans of his website, and we're going to be reading some of those stories from one of his books today because the this is probably one of the best spots 
to get collections of stories like this. And, and if you like this show and you like stories of people's, you know, strange and unusual encounters, then you need to go to Amazon. You need to buy Lon's books and you definitely need to subscribe to his newsletter because he releases new stories, new sightings every single day. Well, let's get into the first story. Now, this first one is about everybody's favorite cryptid. That's right. Bigfoot, the fella, is probably one of my all-time favorites. I know it's yours, too. I know some of you out there is like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Mine's the Jimmikin. Or, you know, like, no, I like I like the Puckwudgie. I like the Wendigo. Or I like, you know, Cam. He likes fey folk stories. I like them all. And that, that's my favorite part is I, I like them all. But let's check out this first one. It says, I grew up near Neobrara, Nebraska, not far from the river. My brother and I were able to do a lot back then. We were outside year-round. We really enjoyed fishing, especially in the river for catfish. This happened back in the 1950s. and Back then, things were very different from now. No one cared much what you did, just so you didn't cause any trouble. Now then, we usually fished in the morning and the evening during the summers, because it was warm. In June 1959, we planned to hike to an area on Medicine Creek and spend a few nights there. We loved camping. It was about five miles from our home. The second night we were there, we started hearing some strange screaming sounds coming from one of the bluffs to the west of us. We thought at first it might have been a woman, but after listening more closely, we decided it was not human. Perhaps it was a fox, perhaps a bobcat. As we listened more intently, we realized it wasn't like anything else we've ever heard before. I just looked at my brother, and he looked at me, and we were like, what is that? Soon after that, we heard something heavy moving through the brush and the trees. Now, I'll admit, we were scared. As the night went on, things quieted down, although the both of us had a really hard time falling asleep. But we eventually did, and the next morning I walked towards the bluff while gathering some more firewood. As I approached a rocky pass, I caught a glimpse of something big, something large and hairy, running away from me. It didn't look like a bear, but whatever it was, it stood at least seven feet high. It was huge and had a wide and muscular back. Well, that was enough for me. I was ready to move camp, you know, someplace else. My brother and I packed up and started back towards the old trail. I guess we had walked around a mile. We then stopped to fish at a good spot that we knew. We spent most of the day there, and the fishing was good. Late afternoon, we decided to hike on back home. I wasn't feeling well anyways. The area was much different than today. It's part of a state park with lots of roads and camp areas today. Back then, it was much more rugged. It was about 6 p.m., we were close to the footbridge at the river. My brother suddenly stopped walking and pointed at a clearing at the riverbank. He said, Someone's over there. We stood there for a minute. Then this huge, hairy creature stood straight up and looked right at us. That's when it let out a loud grunt. It began swinging its arm up and over its head. And we didn't waste any time. We started running. I don't think we stopped until we got near the roadway at the end of the trail. Now, over the years, we talked about our run-in with the creature, and we're both sure that it had to be Bigfoot. I only told a friend about this a few years later, but he thought I was lying to him. We've been back to the same area many times since then, and have never noticed anything. I even contacted the BFRO in the 1990s, but they never came out to take a statement. That's my story. Thanks, Gary T. So that's a pretty interesting story. Once again, it's like so many others. Happened a long time ago in an area that wasn't developed back then. Two brothers enjoying the sunshine and the summer fishing, much like my boys do all the time. And while they're out there, they had an encounter with something strange, something they couldn't explain. You know, at first, naturally, they thought it was a bear. But, you know, we're talking about Nebraska. I mean... Uh, I guess 
possibly a black bear or something could wander into Nebraska. You know, they don't know the state boundaries. But I don't think it's very likely that Nebraska would have a bear. So what was it that they saw? Something large, something hairy, something grunting and even making eerie screams at night. Um, These are all classic tales that I've heard of before when it comes to Sasquatch. People out camping, people out hiking. They 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 seem to be nocturnal at night. People hear tree knocks. They hear grunting. They hear screaming. I've often heard stories of where it sounds like a woman wailing. And I know some of you out there say, "Well, that was a mountain lion." Well, yeah, it it definitely could have been a mountain lion. You know, unless I'm standing there to hear that, to hear what they were hearing. I I cannot explain what these people are seeing, but I mean, a lot of people have the same story. So to me, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, Let's move on to the next one. This person says, hey, Lon, I just subscribed to your newsletter and I'm writing about a Bigfoot encounter I had when I was younger. When I was in high school, my uncle and I would hunt deer and turkey in eastern Kansas. Well, back in 1999, we were near the Maria de Cygnus Refuge, bow hunting for deer in a swampy woodland area. We had been in the same location before and were very familiar with its layout. We've harvested bucks and does out of that area numerous times. It was one of our favorites. Both of us had portable tree stands and we were overlooking the bottom land. We had been in our stands for about an hour to an hour and a half when the event occurred. It was early morning. I don't remember the exact time, but it was light enough to see, but yet the sun had not risen. My uncle was to the right of me in a tree about 50 yards away so we could both see anything moving below us. That's when I heard some splashing from his direction and noticed him waving at me. The splashing was getting louder. I first thought it must be a small herd of deer or something moving my way. As I looked through the thickets though, I noticed something else, something different, something tall something bulky, and it was standing beside a tree. Now, at first, I thought, what's this guy doing out here? Doesn't he know that we're hunting? He could see our stands. Why was this person out here trying to mess up our hunt? That's when I saw something else. I saw something similar a few feet away from the other figure. I looked back over at my uncle. He was crouched down and was still. And even though it was barely light out and 50 yards away, I could see the whites of my uncle's eyes. He looked scared. The two figures below started to move towards me. Then one worked its way into a clearing and I was able to get a good look. It was not a man. It was definitely not human. (sighs) As crazy as it sounds, I think I saw a Bigfoot. Whatever it was, it was huge. I would estimate it to be around eight feet tall. And it was covered from head to toe in matted, muddy, dark hair. This thing was reaching into the water and putting whatever it found in its mouth. I didn't see the other Bigfoot. It must have moved off in another direction. I was as still as possible, even though I was shaking. You know when you're scared when you're playing hide-and-seek with friends, and you're trying to be as quiet as possible, and all you can hear is your breathing and the beating of your heart? Well, it was like that. I was for sure this thing could hear my heartbeat, and I just stayed there and watched. This Bigfoot was now no more than a 100 feet from me, though I was 12 foot in a tree. I must have watched it for nearly 10 minutes or so as it waded through the water, eating whatever it pulled out. It eventually walked away from us towards the woods on the opposite rise. My uncle and I looked at each other again, but of course didn't make a sound. Now I was ready at this point to get the hell out of there, but he remained in his stand, holding his hand palm out to let me know to wait a minute, to hang on. I wasn't even thinking about hunting deer any further that day, believe me. Well, after about 15 or 20 minutes had gone by, My uncle started moving down off his stand, so I did the same, dropping the ladder and climbing down. We walked towards each other and agreed to come back later for the stands. In fact, I didn't go back. 
That afternoon, my dad and grandfather went back with my uncle to look around and retrieve the stands. Both of them believed we saw a Bigfoot. My grandfather said he believes they were eating freshwater mussels or snails. I never went back to that area, even though I do still hunt. That was the only time I've ever seen anything like that. I'd be interested to know if other witnesses have sightings in eastern Kansas or western Missouri. I've heard so many stories, but nothing recent. Chad. Wow, see? This is a story like others I've heard from hunters. It always freaks me out because it's not a one, it's not one person that saw it. It was two guys separated by 50 yards or so. They both sat there and watched this thing muddle around in the swamp or the two of them, you know, eating mussels or clams or crawdads or whatever they were eating. They just watched them. And apparently the Bigfoot were not aware that these guys were up there. How terrifying must it be to see something like that? I mean, I'm a hunter. In fact, you know, we're planning a hunting trip in less than 60 days. Uh, I tell you, when I read these sightings, and I do this a lot when I'm working at home or in the studio down at Skeleton Studios. These stories, you know, I kind of go through them. They don't really stick with me. At least I don't think they do. Until I'm out in the woods alone, then I start remembering all those stories. And that's when I start hearing things. And I have to tell myself I have a very overactive imagination that you're just hearing birds or squirrels and stuff. But anyways, I love that story. Let's move on to the next one. Now, this next story is a bit odd, I will tell you, but like so many other times on this show, we've brought up encounters with things that people can't quite explain. Like I know that um, Cam just a couple episodes ago was talking about the sighting of a giant sloth. Now, this is a creature that once existed in North America. So you have to wonder when people have these sightings, is this a physical being like I've asked Cam before or, you know, just like people see ghosts. Is this an image of an animal that once lived? You know, maybe it was killed somehow by Native Americans or something, and now that that ghost of the sloth is being seen, but it's not actual physical, it's ethereal. I don't know. But this person claims that they actually saw a hyena, and this happened in the Adirondack Park in the state of New York. Now, of course, like we've joked about before, perhaps a uh, person had a pet hyena. I mean, people buy these exotic pets on the black market all the time. And, you know, maybe it got out or maybe they let it loose. I know that they have people release, you know, uh, anacondas in the Everglades and people release Nile crocodiles in the Everglades. You know, this is very careless because people could uh, easily be killed by these things. So perhaps somebody had a, uh, a pet hyena. I was trying to think of a movie I saw one time. I think it might've been with uh, Nicolas Cage, like, God of War, Lord of War, or something like that, where there was this warlord, and instead of having like pit bulls or something, the guy had some pet hyenas on a leash. I kind of think of that when I read this story. But anyways, let's get into the story. It says, a couple years ago, back in 2010, in the southern Adirondacks of New York, in the Adirondack Park, to the amazement of many, America's largest wilderness park, my wife and I saw what can only be described as a hyena chasing several deer across the road. The animal literally stopped dead in front of the car, just staring back at us for what must have been 10 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes before it moved off. Now, I've been in the woods my whole life. I was raised with a gun since I was a child, and I've spent many summers on Lake Champlain. I've hunted, fished, instructed archery and rifle range. I've hiked, coon hunted at night owned horses and ridden horseback through the wilderness and presently live with all kinds of wildlife on my lakefront property. Well, I thought I'd seen it all, but to my shock, I haven't. I have no idea what this creature was that I saw other than to say, man, it looked like a hyena. It was very large, about 150 to 175 pounds. It had a long, bushy tail, brindle. It was wiry. It even had spots and was brown in color. It had a black and gray coat with a powerful predator build. This thing had a thick lower jaw that was rounded, almost diamond-shaped, a triangular head with rounded ears sitting high up on its skull. And what appeared to be a mane almost running down the back 
originating on the neck. I'm telling you, this thing looked exactly like a hyena. Its hind legs were noticeably shorter than the front and much thicker and more powerfully muscled than those on the front, so that the animal sloped down in the powerful rear. I've seen countless hyena on the Discovery Channel or the National Geographic Channel and on Wild Kingdom as a kid, and there's no other option than this strongly resembled what appeared to be a spotted hyena. Well, I got home and I immediately went and searched it, you know, on the internet. Amazingly, it said that the mountain hyena once roamed the Adirondacks and the Appalachians long ago. Well, I've got news for you. At least one still does. My wife and I, who was with me at the time, actually called the New York Encon at Raybrook when we got home and got laughed at. We even received an errant email back ridiculing my report, which was accidentally sent to me instead of an Encon co-worker. Now, this really made me mad, as I had made friends with my local Encon officer who liked to use my property to catch poachers, although we do have an animal park at the end of the lake. When I called, they assured me they have never had any spotted hyena reports in the area. It was only shortly after I saw the Monster Quest episode describing a similar animal in Maine, while the Shunka Warakin was well known to the Iroquois as the dog killer. The supposed Shunka Warakin famous mount seems too far small and too pig-like to be what I saw. Its legs are far too scrawny, and it seems far less canine than what we saw. Also, possessing a longer straight coat and a thinner snout. Well, a few days later, we saw it again, doing the same thing, chasing some deer. There was no doubt this was not a coyote. This was not a wolf. This was not a hybrid or what is called a koi dog. This was a hyena. I'm telling you, that's what we saw. My property has a creek, a creek mouth and a lakefront with four fish spawns. Plenty of deer, coyote, red and gray fox, fisher eagles, turkeys, ducks, blue heron, owls, osprey geese, ducks, turkey vultures, everything. Even the occasional black bear, and sometimes even a small moose. I've seen it all, especially riding on horseback. You name it, I've seen it. And I can definitely say I've never seen anything like this before or since. I'm telling you, I saw a spotted hyena in the wilds of New York. Wow. I mean, everybody knows what a hyena looks like. I believe the guy. I mean, to me, this doesn't seem like a cryptid report as much as I think somebody probably bought this thing uh, on the black market. It, you know, they tried to raise it. It got too big. They had to move, whatever. They released it into the wild. And now the thing is... uh you know, doing what it can to survive by trying to hunt deer. You know, hyenas are pack animals. And I don't know if you know this, but hyenas are gigantic, man. They're like way bigger than like your common dog. Uh, they're bigger than wolves. And these things are ferocious. I mean, if you watch any nature channel, I mean, they kill lions and just about anything else. But they just seem so annoying. You know, like the hyena seems annoying. I don't like them. I, I really don't. But uh, interesting story, interesting sighting nonetheless. Let's move on. If you like that story about seeing a hyena, you're really going to like this one. This is a sighting of something truly unusual. Uh, the person says, hello, Lon. I noticed your article about small dinosaurs in Hebronville, Texas. This witness that you wrote about was not exaggerating because I've seen an unknown animal in a field here in Hebronville. My sighting took place back in April 2011 when I was walking along W. David Street to my friend's house on Rendada Road. It was around 5.45 p.m. I had just gotten off work and was a little tired, but I was glad to be done. On the side of the road where I was walking, I saw dust being kicked up into the air and moving along the field. Then the trail of dust was heading towards the road in front of me. I stopped walking, not knowing what may be exiting the road. I strained my eyes, 
to try to see what the heck was kicking up the dust. Was it a cat? Was it a dog? Who knows? I looked, and about 40 feet in front of me is what I can only describe as a little T-Rex dinosaur. Yeah, you heard me. A tiny T-Rex-looking dinosaur, about two to two and a half feet in height. It didn't stop running as it dashed across the road into a smaller field. It was light and reddish brown. It stood on two legs and had a long tail that was straight out when it ran. There is no way that this was a lizard known to live around here. It looked very much like the photo of the toy that I found online. Now, when I told my friends and family, no one wanted to believe me. My friends and family just think, you must be, you just must have mistaken it for another lizard. You know, stop being silly. But I know what I saw. This was not a native lizard to Texas. It was a small dinosaur. I was beginning to feel like I was going crazy myself until I came across your blog and I read your article. And I believe there are very strange creatures around here. My ex-husband used to talk about huge birds when he was a kid and walking shadows that he and others would see on our ranch south of Hebronville. At one point, several cattle went missing without a trace, and he would never stay the night there. Thank you for reading. You can contact me, MG. Now, that is really strange. No, this is something I would expect my son Luke to talk about seeing in the woods. Uh, I spoke to a lady one time that I worked for uh, when I was younger, and she swears to God that she saw a monkey in the tree. Now, this woman owns a big cattle ranch. Uh, they raise livestock and things like that. These are these are country folk. Uh, I think they're originally from Oklahoma, but they moved here years ago, like back in the 70s. And uh, they're prominent business owners in town. And this woman told me that she swears to God she saw a monkey in the tree. Her husband said, I think she had too much wine that day. Uh, I think she's gone crazy. But, you know, years and years later, she stuck with the story. And I ask her whenever I bump into her in town, do you remember that monkey you saw? And she's like, yeah, I saw it. I know I saw it. I mean, that's what it was. It was like a little monkey, like the one in like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. One of those monkeys. I don't know the types. I don't know the breeds of monkeys. But uh, that's what she said she saw. And uh, as crazy as it is, people claim to see funny things. And uh, oddly enough, you know, that's not the only dinosaur sighting of, or small dinosaur sighting in South Texas. Check this one out. It says, hello, Lon. A couple of months ago in, sun, in a summer or two back, my friend and I actually saw a small dinosaur here in our town on a main street, if you can believe it or not. It was evening when we saw it, probably around 8.45 p.m. We were driving, noticed that the dinosaur crossing the street. We saw the shape clearly as it passed another car's headlights on the opposite side. What we noticed is that the other car didn't seem to notice as the creature as it passed. Now, a couple of months before this, I actually heard a creature I could only describe as sounding like a dinosaur. I'd been asleep, and it was at night, maybe around 1 or 2 a.m. I had awoken, and just at that moment, I heard an unfamiliar screech of something running by my window. Now, we have an AC unit on in the window, like a window unit. So, at this time, the window was kind of cracked open. I heard its footsteps as it ran by, and it was heavy, whatever it was. I could hear it clearly on the ground as it ran further away. I could hear it screech again. It was like nothing I've ever heard in my life. I thought perhaps I was dreaming, but I checked, you know, by pinching myself and moving around. I was wide awake, and whatever I heard, it was too loud and I wonder if anyone else heard it or saw it. I live in an apartment complex. I just laid there in bed, completely bewildered by what I had just heard. I began to question my sanity, and if I had heard what I thought I heard. So when my friend and me saw the dinosaur crossing the road, I became excited, and I told her about what I had heard. I still don't know what we saw but it looked like a dinosaur. Also, what I heard. 
sounded like a dinosaur. Thanks for what you do, CJ. So here's another account. This person is hearing it. They're seeing it. Now, once again, what could they have seen that was running and crossing in front of them? And I like the part of the story where they say it didn't appear that the other cars saw this thing. Because, you know, if if there's a dinosaur running down Main Street, everybody's going to screech to a halt. People are going to be getting out of their car. People are going to be looking. It's like only they saw it. So, you know, that's what, you know, this happens from time to time with, with sightings is you wonder is only the people that are seeing it can see it. Like it's almost a, a vision only to them. I don't know. Or was this a, some, you know, was it a, a shaved ostrich running through town? Cause you know, they kind of run like a dinosaur. You ever seen an ostrich or an emu run? They kind of look like a dinosaur. Well, actually they say that dinosaurs kind of look like them, right? They've been finding feathers on dinosaurs now from when we were kids, you know, they were all just leathery skin. I always wanted to know, like, how do they know what color they are? Like, oh, well, you know, uh, the Archaeopteryx has feathers and, you know, the Brontosaurus is like a grayish blue. T-Rex, he's like red or green, you know, uh, Stygimolic. They got like purple on them. How do they know that? You know, you know, they were just taking a guess. Anyways, let's move on. This next one is pretty creepy. Um, because I think about when I read this story or hear this story in my own mind, few things are scarier than like dark caves for me. I guess I'm a little bit claustrophobic. I mean, I've been in caverns and stuff. I don't freak out, but man, if you were stuck down in there, that would, there's not many things that would be as horrible as that. But this takes place in like a cavern, actually in the mystic caverns in Arkansas. Check out this story. This person says back in 1981, I was working for a contractor as a masonry apprentice after leaving trade school. Well, that summer, we were working at Mystic Caverns in northern Arkansas. We were upgrading tour trails in the caves. On a Friday, it was getting close to quitting time when this happened. So, myself and another guy had to go through the work area and make sure that all the tools were collected and that the safety barriers were back in place. We weren't working during the weekend, so the work area had to be tightened up before we left. The guy who was with me, he needed to leave. I forgot why, so I was down there by myself for a little while, just picking things up, securing barriers, barricades, picking up tools, you know, humming along, just thinking about what I was going to do later on the weekend. I almost finished loading the cart when I heard faint pounding sounds coming from deep within the cavern. I thought that first that maybe one of the crew may still be in the cave, so I yelled out, Hey, is anybody down there? Hey, it's me. Do you need any help? The banging stopped, and it went dead quiet. Then I started to hear slapping sounds for a few seconds. And then it got quiet again. So I yelled out again. Hey, anybody out there? Stop messing around. It's not funny. I didn't get a response. So I figured either it was a co-worker trying to mess with me or perhaps some type of cave critter or maybe bats. Well, I started to make my way out. So I was feeling very uncomfortable. There was an area that I came upon where on the right of the railing, it dropped off into a deep depression. There was some lighting, but difficult to see the bottom of the depression. As I passed by, I heard splashing sounds coming from down in the depression. I stopped, and I got a glimpse of something on two legs walking in the water below. Further away, there was a section of the cavern that opened up that was well lit. As I watched in horror... The splashing continued. Then I saw this thing moving out of the shadows, moving away from me. The only way I can describe it was something walking on two legs with large, I know you don't think I'm crazy, frog feet. This thing, whatever it was, stood about five feet tall and was dark, grayish green. The head was large and rounded though it never turned around. So I can't give much detail about the face, the body, 
was thick in the chest, but narrow at the waist and hips. It bent at the knees when it stepped and had shiny skin. I'm telling you, man, this thing resembled a large frog. I didn't notice any hair. I didn't hear any vocals. Just the splashing as it moved away from me. I'd estimated that it was 70 or so feet from me when I first got a good look at it. I wasn't scared. I was more stunned. I grabbed the car and quickly made my way towards the entrance. When we came back to work the next Monday, I didn't mention anything to anyone. I kept a sharp watch out, though, for anything out of the ordinary, let me tell you. The job lasted a few more weeks, and I didn't observe any other weird stuff. Well, a few weeks after this, I found out that one of my girlfriend's cousins had worked in those same caverns. He replaced the lighting and did other odds and ends, so he was in the cavern a lot. When I got the chance to finally meet him, I pulled him aside, you know, when everybody else walked off and we had a moment alone. And I said, hey, you got a second? He said, yeah. And I said, I got to ask you something. I don't want you to judge me if you can, but I got to ask you something. You used to work in those caves, you know, and I told the name and everything. And he was like, yeah, I worked in those caves. I said, did you ever see anything strange, anything weird, anything out of the ordinary? And he said, no, not that I can recall. I told him I was just wondering. I didn't want to alarm him with the details of what I saw. I wasn't imagining this thing. And after all these years, I still get creeped out when I think about it. I have never heard or read about any other sightings in the Mystic Caverns. So, I'm stunned. I don't know what it was. Robert M. So this guy in a cavern and sees a giant toad or frog man. Literally. Frog-like feet standing up five feet tall. Smooth grayish green skin. I mean, what? I don't know. You know, I hear these stories. Nick Redfern wrote one time about these devolved humans living in the London tunnels under the city, you know, and uh, I've seen episodes of the X-Files where there's like a fluke man, you know, living in the sewer. You know, this is the same type of thing. It makes me wonder about these crazy stories of frogmen. But uh, if you like these stories and want to read or hear more, you got to go over to Amazon Go to search Phantoms and Monsters. He's got these cool books on there. I'll put links to it in the show notes. You can also follow along on Phantoms and Monsters website, and you can listen to him on Arcane Radio. I hope you guys enjoyed those stories. If you have any cool stories of your own, please email them to me and Cam at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. And if they're cool, we will tell them on the air and as well as forward them to our buddy Lon so your story may bless the pages of a future Phantoms and Monsters book. Let's take a break. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. I really like those stories. I like those eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts are some of my favorite. And um, I like the way Lon Strickler uh, categorizes these things and, and, and releases these books um, that, so you can read them yourself. So you can go to Lon's uh, website, phantomsandmonsters.com, or you can go on Amazon and you can buy these books. He's got several of them out there now. And these are just collections of people's sightings, much like the work that Robert Rosales was doing. Yes. Or Albert Rosales, I mean. And um, this is just like a continuation of that. So I find these stories really interesting. If you're interested in stories like this, just head on over to Amazon, and I'll put links to it in the show notes. And you can get yourself a book, and you can have hours and hours of reading of eyewitness accounts. Um, Cam, have you seen the videos? You know, it used to be, it used to be a big deal if you knew somebody – that climbed Mount Everest, right? Yeah. Because it wasn't even done by yes. a human until like the 50s, the early 50s, right? It became like a milestone, a big thing. Like, wow, this person climbed Mount Everest. But now have you seen, like now it is so common that there's literally a line from the bottom to the top. It looks like Woodstock up there, man, that like 100,000 people a year climb it. Yeah, it's so not even the same Maybe thing. not that much, but yeah. tens of thousands. It's ridiculous. And... He said that I saw a recent article on Fox News uh, about the one of the biggest problems they said right now is not people dying on Mount Everest 
from pulmonary edema or falling to their death, you know, in a huge crevasse. The biggest problem right now is a plumbing problem. They said that the the biggest problem right now on Everest is human waste. Yes. They said hundreds of people for weeks are using the restroom in open toilets and uh, when it when the snow melts, it all goes downstream, and people at the bottom, you know, this is this is their water table. There, a lot of them are drinking this water, and it's filled with human waste. They say it's impossible to know how much litter is now spread across Mount Everest, but they said at Camp Two, which is two levels higher than the base camp there, they said Sherpas uh, believe they gathered up get this camp seventeen thousand six hundred and thirty seven pounds. Of human excrement. That's how much was left last year. Golly. So, I mean, it is just like an open sewer now. What? Uh, it's just ridiculous, right? We ruin everything. We ruin everything. We ruin everything. So now, if you, if you had this lifelong dream to go climb Mount Everest, you're literally climbing through human waste to get to the top. Well, like you said, it used to mean something, too. And now it doesn't mean anything. Because yeah. it used to, look, technology makes everything easier. And now that's what this is. Everything's gotten so much easier now. Yeah, they said that uh, during the melting conditions at Camp 2 this last year, the odor was sickening to climbers. And they said that 10 Sherpas got stomach illness from bad water at Camp 2. Yeah, no joke. And they believe it's because of as the snow melts, it brings down all that human waste. It's doo-doo, baby. It's doo- That's exactly right. <laughs> So, you know, they're, they're trying to beg people to start using biodegradable bags that have these natural enzymes in them, which will decompose human waste. Here's the thing. If it becomes so common that there's thousands of people doing it every year, is it really that big of a deal anymore? No. And the biggest problem, too, is that the economy for the people around there that depend on this, because it wasn't a thing for the longest time, it wasn't a deal. Now there's so many of these these families that have become guides and you know and and packers and do all this stuff to take wealthy folks up on top of the mountain. Yes, that they it's a it's a job, it's a whole thing. And now that if if the government was to step in and go, that's it, we are limiting this to like lottery systems only, which yeah. yeah. I, I think it's the way it should be done. I think it should be a lottery system the way it is whenever you, you know, you hunt here in America. Like if it's going to destroy that whole area and be, you know, poisonous and whatnot to the water systems and all that, turn it into a lottery system. And I don't mean like, don't do the auction because then it just prices, it. make it be a lottery system, but only offer maybe a hundred trips a year in the lottery system. I agree. You know, you. whatever, but where that way it's, Everybody puts in, and let's say you put, you know, you only get a certain amount back after you put in the rest of it, and it goes to helping sustain the economy, but lessen the impact of what goes on on there. Because I've heard some insane stories about like a man and his wife. One story I heard was going up there, and oh, uh, yeah, I've seen that picture. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you know, and if the Sherpa's packing all your food, all your gear, all your stuff, and you basically are just holding a rope and walking up, I mean, where's the challenge? That's, well, that was what made it so challengeable. Challenge, what made it such a great what, challenge? Wait, wait, what word was I that? I don't know. Challengeable. That's not even a real word. Well, it's. I'm what made have, it such? I'm a challenge, jotting these down. What made it such a great challenge was the ability to even do it. Yes, you had to go. You know these crevasses and these ice walls, and there no it was the lack of oxygen. Difficult. It was very dangerous. They've sugar coated it down to where it's so easy. It's streamlined like, so much that I mean it's. You know, what do you think Sir Edmund Hillary thinks about it now? Oh, I bet he's, you know, breakdancing in his grave. <laughs> be so aggravated. It's just ridiculous. And it just infuriates me where, like, now it's people are just using the toilet all over the thing. It's terrible. I've never been one of those guys to really be in awe of Mount Everest. Uh, now, I like, like, what Alex Honnold does. Like, when guys climb the difficult stuff. But to me, like, I'm, I'm, and I understand it's a difficult thing to do. But I'm like, it's just a, a tall spot. Yeah. Like, it's just really high up. That's what makes, I'm like, awesome. I don't know. I just, I was never one of those guys that really got into the whole Everest thing. Like, as a kid, I did. As a kid, I thought it would be awesome yeah. because it was still an adventure that used to, you know, because there wasn't a lot left. When you were a, a kid, left. it was like 1975. It only been, the first person to climb it was only like 20 years <laughs> before you were born. Oh, yeah. When, when I first remember hearing about it, you know, I was like, a, like 10 or 11 years old. 
it was it was unbelievable, right? I mean, it was like, how could anybody do that? Like that's that's defying all odds of human, you know, anything that they didn't a man have the could gear do. that they do now, though. You know what I mean? No. Like there was no, they didn't have North Face or Marmot freaking jackets and and, and all these breathing apparatuses. And, and then the way you're just imagine the tents that you had to sleep in back in the day up there. Yeah, it was no sawtooth. It's crap. <laughs> There's nothing to keep you warm. You got like some some waxed canvas to try to keep snow and ice off of you. You know, I just yeah, I don't I know. Agree. But seeing the damage that they're doing, it does bother me. Yeah, I wish they would kind of limit access to it. They limit access to other places. Let's limit access to them. You have to. You yeah. have to. Or we'll tear it up. Look or, at it. That's what we're would, doing. People will tear it up. That's exactly yeah, right. We'll um, tear it up. What do you got planned for your week, man? Oh man, we're off. Uh, the municipality I work for is closed on Fourth of July. There you go. So basically I have to get a lot of stuff done in three days because, and I will be going to work the day after the fourth, sadly, but it's going to be like a dead zone there because I've already talked to several of uh, the other employees and they're not coming in. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a ghost town around there, but so I have a lot to get done in three days. Basically. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to be shooting fireworks or anything like that. No. But luckily, it's been raining a lot, so there's not really a chance of a fire. You know, lots of times this time of year, you got to be real careful about where you're shooting your fireworks. Well, like during the wedding that I went to, or that I conducted, it was in the upper 90s. Like, I think it was it was 98 or 99 down there whenever whenever we did the wedding. But if you look at the 4th of July, it's going to be in the 80s. Yeah. It's going to be beautiful. So it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, we'll take it. I will take this kind of weather. I love it. This has been, it's hot, but I don't mind it. But yeah. Now, aren't we going to go play some disc golf? I think so. I think we need to go play disc golf that morning. Yeah, we'll Uh, do that. Everybody who's out there listening to that, listening to this in the States, please be careful out there on the 4th. Don't drink too much. You know, watch your kids around the pool, things like that. If you have any stories of your own you'd like to share with me and Cam, please do so. You can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com can call the show 817-945-3828 and you can follow us on all forms of social media till next time folks i'm kyle he's cam peace y'all